This is Tim, and this is Deconstructing Comics. Welcome to Deconstructing Comics. This is Tim in Tokyo. This week, more from my trip to Minneapolis as I talk to two local comics creators with very different target audiences. We'll be hearing from Lucid, a young woman working on the webcomic Aviale, which is of the boys' love genre. Through crowdfunding, she's earning her living at it. She'll talk about how that can be a double-edged sword, and about how she's working to give her comics more positive messages than boys' love sometimes entails. But first, from the other end of the spectrum, mainstream artist Christopher Jones, known for his run on The Batman Strikes, and currently working on Doctor Who comics for Titan. He'll talk about how he got typecast for doing cartoony animation tie-in comics, his view on the Minneapolis comic scene, and more. First, just a reminder that you can help this podcast by making your Amazon purchases via deconstructingcomics.com slash Amazon, and make that your bookmark for future purchases. We'll then get a percentage of what you spend. It costs you nothing extra and helps us cover web hosting and the other costs of presenting this show every week. We really appreciate your support. So I'm talking with Chris Jones here in Minneapolis, but we're on Skype. Uh, we did uh, meet in person last night at the New Comic Book Day event. Um, yes. And that kind of was interesting to me. I didn't know anybody was doing an event like that. Yeah, I mean, it's it's relatively new. I think they've been doing it uh, just a couple months now. Um, and uh, it's fun. Uh, they're still inventing new things. Uh but yeah, I mean, it's a free show. It's if you if you're in the Twin Cities and love comics, it's worth checking out. Yeah, both comic books and stand-up comedians. Uh, yes, yes, <laughs> they they have it all covered. If if you like comics but you're not sure how you want to find the word, they've got you covered either way. <laughs> uh, now you uh, grew up here in the Twin Cities. Well, southern Minnesota. I've been in the Twin Cities for oh a good twenty plus years now, but started out uh, in small towns in in southern Minnesota, bouncing around. But yeah, Minnesota native, definitely. Hmm. Okay. Um, and uh, uh, how long have you been doing like DC and Marvel comics? Um. Well, I broke into DC Comics uh, just about 20 years ago. Not quite. Um, I have been uh, doing comics full-time since 2004, which is when um, I got the gig to be the regular artist on The Batman Strikes, which was the tie-in comic for The Batman uh, animated series. Um, okay. and, uh, you know, before that I had, had done some stories here and there for DC, uh, including some stuff for Justice League Adventures, but it was always, you know, a story here, a story there, and then a couple months might go by before they had something for me again. So it was something I was doing on the side while maintaining a day job. Uh, but it was, you know, when I got a regular monthly project from them then i could afford to to you know move into doing it uh, as a full-time thing mm -hmm. i see um <laughs> so kind of what was your path to breaking in i guess everybody has a different different way to get there yeah i mean even now that i'm supposedly in i feel like every every gig i get comes to me through a different channel i wish it was more predictable um <laughs> Uh, well, I, you know, I had been doing work for smaller publishers, uh, which is a little easier to do than to work for the big guys, because usually the smaller publishers are paying, uh, little or no money up front, and are, you know, if you can do moderately professional looking work and, and can convince them that you're semi-reliable, you know, you usually can find it in, um, but, uh, 
I hadn't managed to do anything for DC or Marvel yet. I had been submitting samples to both, and this was long enough ago that the uh, the way of doing that um, was um, sending photocopies of art samples by U.S. mail because uh, there was a limit to how many conventions that any editors were in attendance that I could I could get to. Um, and it, I hadn't had any luck yet. And uh, I saw an ad in a, a comics industry magazine that Warner Brothers Animation, uh, which was still at the time producing their their 90s uh, Batman and Superman shows, uh, they were looking for additional freelance artists to do storyboards, minor character design, I don't know what all. Um, so I did some samples that were in that kind of a Bruce Tim inspired style um, and sent those in. And while that didn't get me anything with Warner Brothers Animation, I included those samples in the next wave of stuff I sent out to comics editors. And uh, they were seen by an editor at DC that was looking for an artist to do a fill-in issue on a book they had that was drawn in a slightly more cartoony style. Uh, the book was called Young Heroes in Love, <laughs> which was about, I think the way it was described to me, uh, it was meant to be kind of the, the, a garage band of a superhero team. You know, they're like little guys that weren't as well known, um, but the, the book focused more on their personal lives in between their adventures fighting bad guys. Mm -hmm. Uh, which is a fun idea. Yeah. And uh, like I said, it was drawn in a slightly more cartoony style. And I think because of that, the editor didn't have as big of a pool of artists he knew he could go to that could do that kind of a style. So when my stuff crossed his desk with those Bruce Kim inspired samples in it, that got my foot in the door. Um, and, you know, I got some work on that book and that, you know, got me in touch with editors that then knew to use me on some other stuff that came along. DC was doing a lot of those uh, anthologies with five and ten page stories at the time. Uh, Secret Files and 80 Page Giants and some of those mm. things the late 90s, uh, early 2000s. Um, and then that led to, like I said, some, some issues of uh, although that had a rotating creative team on it, so it wasn't regular monthly employment it was just mm, th maybe three times a year or something like that what book was that um, yeah, uh, justice league adventures okay the, the tie-in to the justice league animated series um and then uh i heard that there was going to be a brand new batman animated series and i thought well i know how this works uh <laughs> there will be a comic book tie-in for it even though they haven't announced it yet i'm sure there will be one so I, uh, I asked my editor, do you know who's going to be editing that book? Because I want to throw my hat in the ring right now to, to draw the, the book. And I ended up doing a couple samples for it, and I got the gig. And that was the beginning of me being a full-time comics professional and uh, getting to be the regular artist on a Batman book for four and a half years. Mm. Wow, okay. Now, you've done, I guess, mostly DC. There are a couple, a couple of Marvel issues. Yeah, not as much. Um, and some of the, a lot of what I've done for Marvel either uh, is cartoonier stuff or has not been seen. Um, I've done I've done some like artwork for their licensing department. I drew um, a big eighty page uh, Avengers coloring book <laughs> that <laughs> they ended up just sort of taking the pages for it and splitting it apart and like using it as bits of other books mm -hmm. rather than doing the big 80 page book it was intended as mm -hmm. um uh i did some some stuff for the uh marvel superhero squad um uh the you know which was the animated show that they had I, I did some stuff that was actually used on the show uh but also then um one of their comic stories uh i did some stuff for uh their Avengers Earth's Mightiest Heroes tie-in book, so yet another um, animated tie-in thing. I never set out to specialize in doing 
animated Italian stuff and, <laughs> and doing car- doing cartoony stuff is not the only style I do. It's just one of those things where you get known for doing a thing and then you get more offers to do similar stuff. Yeah, so, I was going to say, like, it sounds like you could do other work. It's just that's kind of how you got your foot in the door and that's what you became known for. So Yeah, it's, it's kind of like the way you hear about actors getting stereotyped. Mm. That can happen with other kinds of creators uh, as well. Um, you know, but... Recently, I've been doing uh, Doctor Who and other some other science fiction stuff, and so so I've broken out of that to some degree. Uh, but you know, a lot of not all, but a lot of my superhero credits are uh, you know animation uh, based stuff. Uh, the the most notable of which is probably uh, after after the Batman Strikes would be my my run on the Young Justice comic, which was a ton of fun to work on. Uh, I'm, we're hoping, with uh, you know them having finally greenlit a third season of Young Justice, that DC might decide to bring uh, the comic book back as well. Uh, Greg Weissman, who I worked on that with, and who's one of the two producers of the TV show, he and I would love to do more of the comic, but that's that is totally DC Comics' decision. So we're we're hoping that they'll decide they want to bring that back. But so far, we have not heard anything. Hmm, I see. Now, have you done any writing? I only found like a couple of credits of, of your you to you for uh, writing. <laughs> yeah, I uh, when I was starting out with some small press stuff, I did some writing. Um, when I was doing uh, my most regular work for DC, uh, including when I was you know on, on the Batman strikes, um, I kept asking about whether I could pitch some stories because. Uh, you know, I, I know Batman pretty well <laughs> and <laughs> felt like I, I, have, I have some story ideas for things that would be fun to do with Batman. I could I could write some scripts for this. Um, and uh, it is not an unfamiliar phenomenon to, to freelancers working in this industry. I, 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 I discovered that uh, if I asked about, you know, would it be OK to pitch some stories? And I would include that as like one among like three questions in an email. Um, the other questions questions would get answered and I just wouldn't get a yes or a no on that one. So eventually I kind of took the hint. Um, the, uh, the one, the one writing credit I do have at DC was on an issue, um, of the Batman strikes. And that's because, uh, I met at a convention, one of the writers that was contributing to that book, uh, a gentleman named Russell LaSalle. And he was saying that, uh, you know, he'd written some stories for the book, but was, would love to do a Joker story and hadn't been able to figure out um, a plot for a Joker story that wasn't too violent for an all-ages version of Batman and the Joker. Mm. And I said, oh, I have an idea that I, you know, I wanted to do with the Joker. I mentioned my idea, and he was like, oh, wow, that's a great idea. Oh, but that's your idea. Hey, you <laughs> want to go write it with me? So we... He basically, you know, we pitched the idea to DC, and DC apparently didn't have a problem with me co-writing a story. So we developed it together, and, and I've got a co-writer credit on it in, in addition to, to drawing it. Uh, but I never got to, to write another one after that. So, yeah, I mean, I, I would like to do some writing. I, I just feel like uh, making any headway in the industry as a writer feels like a completely separate track and completely starting over from whatever cachet I have built for myself as an artist. Mm. So should the opportunity present itself, I would love to, but I'm kind of more focused on just making sure I've got the next drawing gig lined up. Mm, I see. Um, have you done any, any work for comics that was uh, creator owned? Uh, well, I worked with a cartoonist named John Cav- Valak a number of years ago on a, um, a humor book that was, uh, the title of it was Dr. Blink, Superhero Shrink. Mm. Uh, the way it was pitched to me was uh, it's the Bob Newhart show if all of his psychiatric patients were superheroes. <laughs> so uh, we did a number of issues of that. There's a trade paperback of it out. Uh, I, I'm very fond of that book. Um, Who was the publisher for that? Uh 
John Kavalik uh, publishes a lot of his own stuff onto the label Dork Storm Press <laughs> uh, uh, because it, he has a long-running comic called Dork Tower, so it's Dork Storm Press. Um, and uh, it, it came out through that initially. Uh, if, if you if you Google Dr. Blink, it, it still has its own website and the the trade paperback is newly back in print, so it's out there if you if, if anyone wants to check it out. Uh, plus Comixology, so yeah. Hmm. I see. Um, so yeah, we were talking about last night. It seems like uh, Minneapolis has a, a comics community that's becoming maybe a little more active, a little a kind of growing, I guess, because of the presence of MCAD here and and so forth. Yeah, it's it's hard to judge. I don't pretend to know enough about the comic scene from locality to locality to know how disproportionately robust ours is. But boy, it does seem like we've got a lot of comics creators in the local area. And yeah, certainly the the comics program at MCAD um, hasn't hurt. Um, but. Uh, yeah, it, you know it's 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 exciting to have so many uh, local pros here, and I'm a big fan of the the long running uh, MCBA conventions and and some of the smaller uh, cons that are around. And I know we've got a, a new one uh, starting up this Minnesota Fan Fest convention. And you know, I, I imagine as as you know all all those continue to develop, uh, it'll just uh, you know, make make the local comic scene you know that much more vibrant. Hmm. Yeah. So, what what kind of thing would you like to draw that you haven't drawn yet? Uh, I'd love a chance to do more Marvel stuff. Uh, you know, one of the things I did for Marvel that that has not been seen is I did an inventory story for um, uh, one of their Spider Man books hmm. that sat on a shelf until the the status quo of the book had changed to the point where like there's no way to ever go back and use that story so that's just not not i mean i got paid to do it which is great but you know you do stuff and you want you want to reach an audience so it's sort of frustrating that it never got seen um so yeah i you know i i've gotten to to work a little on marvel characters i'd love to do a lot more i mean i'm certainly you know i'm I would be happy to develop uh, more original projects. I, I can't say that I've got like a whole stack of specific, existing, already written out properties in my back pocket that I am, am itching to do. But you know, given the opportunity, you know, I, I certainly love developing stuff. Uh, I'm going to be doing more Doctor Who uh, stuff for Titan Comics, which is great because I'm a big Doctor Who fan. Um. You know, and heck, I'd love to do more at DC. So much of so much of the stuff that I have done there has been these animated tie-in books. Uh, you know, while I would very dearly love to to go back and do more Young Justice, I'd also love the chance to do some superhero stuff where I wasn't following uh, animation model sheets and could actually put a little more of my own stamp on stuff. So. Mm. Or how about one of those uh, Hanna Barbera uh, books like the Flintstones, where they sort of <laughs> redesign everything? Oh, I guess I just I you know the I I have nothing against those, but I I don't know I I'm, I look at I look at a '60s cartoon I'm a fan of, and I don't have a particular desire to deconstruct it and do it in a completely different style. I either kind of want to like stay true to the spirit of the original, or do something completely different. So. Hmm. But you know, I, given the if they said, "Hey, Chris, we want to bring you in to draw this," I, I I I wouldn't say no. I I always enjoy a challenge, and and uh, you know, part of part of what I think has been a, a defining thing for my career is I have been all over the place stylistically. I really change up my artwork a lot depending on the needs of the project. Uh, you know the. The animation tie-in stuff I have done uh, it does not even remotely resemble um, stuff I've done based on uh, live-action properties like Batman 66 or Doctor Who. Uh, and, you know, I've done other stuff that's just, it's all over the place. Uh, so it's always fun to do something new and different. Hmm. Well, 
Yeah, speaking of new and different, I wonder, I mean, the discussion that I've been having with another of the the regulars on this podcast is, so uh, he, he gets frustrated with Marvel and DC because he feels like they just keep doing the same thing all the time. And do, is, do you think there'd be any room, you know, as the comics audience has changed, that they could try to do a wider variety of kind of genres or different kinds of books rather than superheroes or maybe rather even than science fiction, something else? Well, I, I think you see both Marvel and DC uh, to varying degrees of success at different times um, attempt to do that. I think one of the challenges they have is that they are so successful and so dominant in the realm of superheroes, uh, it's kind of hard for them to do something else and have it be on a comparable tier of, of success and, and, you know, reaching the same size audience as these mega franchises that are like nothing else in the industry. Plus, you know, if you're looking for something that isn't Batman or Spider-Man, um, you know, I think there's a tendency of like, well, then you don't look at Marvel and DC, you look at, at other smaller publishers. Yeah. You know, that said, uh, you know, both companies have, have produced some really cool, interesting, uh, different stuff. I mean, I think clearly uh, when you look at uh, stuff like, you know, uh, DC's recent effort to transform their Vertigo line or reboot their Vertigo line into this this young animal imprint, uh, it 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 feels to me like it's very much an attempt to go after some of that kind of indie comic vibe and do something that isn't their standard DC superheroes. And, uh, you know, I, like I said, I, I think, I think there's, there are challenges doing that when you are DC and Marvel, but there's also opportunities that you have when you're DC or Marvel that none of the little guys have. So mm -hmm. I don't know. Interesting to, interesting to watch. Hmm. Yeah. Do you have much chance to read comics, or are you too busy making them? Uh, you know, I like to when I can, but right now I am so far behind on my comics reading. Uh, you know, I, I get asked, like, what are you following right now? I'm like, oh, man, can you ask me about something else? Because I am so far behind on everything. Well, only the book that you're drawing. <laughs> yeah, pr pretty much. Uh, you know, I, I need to get better at that, because I need to be more in tune with what's going on but uh, maybe i need to start just set the day aside where it's like all right i'm just going to read other people's stuff today but uh then you then you start getting into weird headspace where you're like oh wow why am i not drawn like that guy because i'm not that guy i'm this guy <laughs> why is it you know i i let's just do my own thing and not worry about what anybody else is doing so Ugh. but yeah I, I need to follow more i'm not following much right now i need to get better on that <sighs> hmm. um so, well, what would you like to read if you had time? <laughs> um, uh, how would you have liked the film if you'd actually gotten to see it? I don't know. Um, I, you know, I, I hear, I hear, I hear so many good things. I, I think one of the one of the things I find challenging uh, about sampling stuff when when I have the opportunity in recent years is that so many. Uh, modern comics are are built uh, around these longer story arcs, and it makes it a lot harder to just sample something and get um, get enough of a taste or get enough of a complete experience from a single issue that you can decide how much you really want to go back and pick up more. Uh, and obviously, some writers and some titles are better at that than others, but it's hard to know what those are and where to look if you aren't already familiar with everything. Mm. So, um, you know, one, one thing, if, if I ran the circus, um, I, you know, at either Marvel or DC, I would have a rule that any character that is popular enough to sustain multiple titles. So, you know, your, your Batman's and your Spider-Man's and all those characters, at least one of those titles needs to be all ages friendly, 
not necessarily a kid's book, just something that it would be okay for a kid to read. Um, it needs to be self-contained from the rest of the continuity. It needs to be the popular culture version of the character. So if you want to do a storyline where you kill off Bruce Wayne and somebody else is Batman for a year before you decide to bring Bruce Wayne back, that's fine. But over in this book, Bruce Wayne is still Batman. Yeah. Um, and you know, it needs to be something that is reasonably self-contained. I mean, the occasional, or uh, uh, I should say, um, uh, the occasional two-parter is fine, but don't do something that takes six issues to play out. You know, do something that like either either ends on a definite cliffhanger and you resolve it the next issue, or done in one. Um, you know, when we were doing the Batman Strikes. Uh, I would have so many fans come up to me at conventions and say that they loved that book or that it was even the, their favorite Batman book that DC was putting out. And it had nothing to do with the fact that it was based on an animated TV show. It was because it was a book that they could share with their kids. It was a book that reminded them of the comics that they got hooked on when they were kids. Uh, and it was still just, you know, Batman and Robin... Uh, and sometimes Batgirl uh, fight a bad guy every month, hmm. and and you know I don't think I don't think the only way to do that is in a, a kitty book. Uh, I you know I, I I I I look at the comics that got me hooked on these characters when I was a kid, and you know writer, writers used to pull that off all the time. They pulled it off in every book every month. Um, it doesn't mean you can't have subplots. Doesn't mean you know everything has to be super super simplistic. It's a different writing style. You can do different kinds of stories when it's it's spread out over multiple issues and everything's interconnected. I'm just saying everything doesn't have to be that way. So that's that's what I would that's what I would do if I ran the circus, mm -hmm. which I don't. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm I'm pretty sure Marvel is doing something like that with Spider Man. I have no idea about Batman. Yeah, I know they've made efforts uh, like that here and there. I'm just saying that would be that would be a rule for me for like every character that is a a, a franchise within the company that mul maintains multiple titles. It's like one of them would be, you know, the thing I just described. Yeah. So. Mm -hmm. um, so, what's your or if if there is one, what what's your usual kind of work routine like? Oh, ah. Um, uh, Boy, I wish I was more disciplined. I tend to, uh, when, you know, when I've got a project that has a running deadline, I tend to get up and work uh, a, at the exclusion of <laughs> of being social and doing other normal things until I run out of steam for the day and start over again uh, the next day. Uh, I, I tend I tend to just like work furiously for a frightening number of hours a day until I get done, and then usually I take a breather for for uh, a few days until the cycle starts over again. Um, but uh, but yeah, I've got I've got a studio uh, in my apartment. I work from home, as is pretty common for most artists, I think. Um, you know, I still I still run into people not really familiar with the comic scene that are are kind of surprised to learn that. We, we 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 comics creators can live all over. We don't have to be, you know, out in New York or Los Angeles where the publishers are. Mm -hmm. Not not too much of. I, I I every time I just I tell myself I'm going to have a a, a routine schedule. We're like, oh, I will get up at this hour of the morning and work this many hours, and then knock off for the night. It's like eh, the reality of deadlines always seems to blow those plans out of the water. <laughs> Yeah, I think I think Dan Jurgens tries really hard to to keep a schedule and kind of confine work to work hours. And I don't know how he does it. And but. and bless his heart and more power <laughs> to him. I wish he could teach me the trick because I <laughs> never managed that myself. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure it's difficult. Um, but uh, yeah, so uh, what's coming up from you? Um, well, I, I am starting work on another Doctor Who project for Titan Comics. They have not announced it yet, so I can't say what it is. But it is another miniseries featuring a classic series Doctor. I can say that much. And so this is following up on the the third Doctor series I did last year with uh, Paul Cornell, which was a ton of fun to do. 
Uh, no, Paul is not working on this. Paul has decided that he's, for the foreseeable future, going to focus on stuff that he created himself. Mm. So that kind of unfortunately takes Doctor Who off the table. So uh, hopefully we'll get a chance to work on something together again down the road. We've been talking about it, but uh, but not not right away and not on this. So yeah, uh, another Doctor Who thing next. But I, but uh, I'll, when when I can announce what it is, it'll be all over my social media. But I can't say quite yet. Coming up, Lucid talks about making a living from her boys' love webcomic Aviale. I'd like to be making my living from podcasting. You can help. If you're enjoying this podcast and want to support it, go to patreon.com slash deconcomics and pledge any amount on a monthly basis. If you're not prepared to make a commitment, but you'd like to throw something in the tip jar, you can also make a one-time donation of any amount through PayPal. Send it to donate at deconstructingcomics.com. We appreciate your support. Are you willing to follow me on a journey and risk getting lost in a swirling maze of past ages, protected only by our red indestructible capes as we break through the final unexplored realm of the time barrier to explore the fantastic Silver Age adventures of the world's greatest hero, Superman? If so, join me each week on the Superman Fan Podcast as together we'll follow the Man of Steel, his cousin Supergirl, and his closest friends, Perry White, Lois Lane, Jimmy Olsen, Lana Lang, Batman and Robin, and others in Superman's never-ending quest to defend truth and justice in the pages of Action Comics, Superman, World's Finest Comics, Superman's pal Jimmy Olsen, and Superman's girlfriend Lois Lane. Go to the supermanfanpodcast.blogspot.com, available on iTunes and most other podcast aggregators, you can also follow the podcast on Facebook, Twitter, Tumblr, Medium, Flipboard, and Stitcher. And after you listen, feel free to send email to supermanfanpodcast at gmail.com. And unless you request otherwise, I look forward to reading your comments on future episodes. And don't forget to wear your red indestructible cape, standard safety equipment for traveling through the time barrier. Okay, so now I'm sitting outside of a coffee shop with Lucid. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Pretty good. Um, decided to sit out here um, because kind of music and stuff inside. I thought the car ish, car sounds will not be as bad <laughs> as it would be, maybe be a better recording. Anyway, so um, so you're making a web comic. Um, and see if I can pronounce the name. <laughs> Aviale? It's... Um... I pronounce it aviolang. Aviolang. However, it's a Latin word, mm. and it's impossible to find a per- correct pronunciation for it, so anything goes. Okay, well, what does it mean in Latin? Uh, it's a type of uh, kind of encompassing phrase to uh, refer to like many, many different species. Um, so it's like birds and dinosaurs and just any wind creature, basically. Mm, okay. So it's a pretty large category. Yeah, yeah. I see. Okay. Uh, one one <laughs> aspect of the story here is that one of the characters one of the characters has found himself sprouting wings. Yeah, yeah. The whole premise of the story is uh, a boy grows wings and gets a boyfriend. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much my one sentence pitch. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, when I first saw what it was, I was thinking maybe this fit into the uh, boys' love category. Um, but I was surprised at how much non-sexual stuff there was in it. I mean, it takes a long time yeah, to get a, to that aspect It's a of slow it. burn. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it, it is a boy's love. I consider it a boy's love. I've always intended it to fall into that genre. Um, but I think a lot of people do get confused when they start reading it because it takes so long to get to that. Yeah. Um, so, <laughs> I can see why uh, the slow burn kind of throws people off. Yeah, like, what do you need as NSFW? I mean, I could sit in my, in my office and read this. <laughs> I know, it takes, like, a 200 pages to get to that part. So. Yeah. <laughs> I, like, I like build up, so... Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay, well, what what attracted you to doing a boy's love 
story? Um, well, it's something I've, I mean, it's pretty much the reason I started doing comics in the first place, because I liked reading it when I was in middle school, and I still enjoy it today, so it's the genre that I enjoy most. Mm, I see. Of course, I live in Japan. Oh, cool. Um, and, I mean, I just, I don't, I'm not really a boys' love reader. Sure. I'm not really the target audience. Um, <laughs> but uh, what I've seen of those, there's usually a certain art style to it, and yours is different. It looks sort of Japanese manga style, but not boys' love style. Yeah, um, my, my style has changed a lot over the past uh decade since I started doing comics. Um, so it did start off a little bit more like in the manga style, but I have done different things and experienced different like types of comics here and I kind of soaked everything up and distilled that into what I'm working with now. Yeah, it, it sort of um, almost reminds me of more of an anime style. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I can see or, that. You know, I guess you know, there are a lot of web comics that are kind of in that yeah. region. <laughs> the wing aspect of it, where, what, where did that come from? Why, why did you decide to do that? Um, I honestly, it was just a burst of inspiration. A lot of people ask me, like, where'd you get the idea? I'm like, I don't know, my dude. <laughs> it just kind of <laughs> came out of nowhere. I thought it would be a fun idea to do a story about a boy who grows wings, and that story has kind of been done before. But I was more interested in like how that affects like his actual realistic human life and throwing a relationship in there made it even more interesting to me. Okay. Well, I mean, are you interested in birds? Is... Not really. Not really? I mean, I don't <laughs> dislike them. I like animals in general, but uh, I'm not like a bird fanatic. I don't own a bird. I have a cat. I'm a cat person. But... <laughs> yeah. Cat likes birds for she, dinner, maybe. Yeah, yeah. She would very much enjoy that. <laughs> I see. Um, hmm. So now we're we're in the area of MCAT here, yep. uh, uh, Minneapolis College of Art and Design. Were, are you were you a student there? I did. I graduated in 2011. Okay. So it's right down the road, actually. You can actually probably see it if you look hmm. hard enough. Yeah, I, I walked right past yeah. the sign for MCAT as mm -hmm. I was on the way here. Um, yeah. So. Are you from this area? Or? Yeah, I am, uh, I'm from a little bit south of Minneapolis originally, um, but I live in Minneapolis now. I went to school at MCAD. Uh, I got a degree in comic art, obviously. Um, and it was fine. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So how do you go, go about uh, promoting a comic like this? Um, well, the great thing about web comics is that, like, you can just put things out there and people will read it eventually. Um, so I find a lot of it is like planting the seed of, um, like, I started doing comics 10 years ago, so people who were reading my comics 10 years ago are still reading my comics today. Um, so once, once you give people something for free on the internet, they are very grateful for you. <laughs> so they tend to follow you for a very long period of time. Um, but I also uh, like promote myself on social media like Twitter and Tumblr and all the webcomic sites and everything. Um, and I, I, I also, uh, I do a lot of fan art. I have a doujinshi circle that I also manage with a friend. Um, and that, I find that fan art always brings in more people than original art. So I bring people in fan art, and then I present them my original art. Mm. And they're excited for that too. Okay. <laughs> the other gets them in the door. Yes, exactly. Okay. I, it's, Webcomics marketing is kind of tricky because there's not really rules for it. There's not like an established uh, like set of things that you can do that'll get you to the, being popular or whatever. You just kind of have to feel it out and feel out your, your audience and where your audience is mm -hmm. because different parts of the internet exist in different places. Now, have you tried any other outlets? Have you like self-published it? Done any print oh, version? Oh, yeah, or? I do. I. Okay. I mean, I'm essentially a self-publisher. I do have physical copies of all my books. Um, I, I mean, I've, I've pretty much been self-publishing for as long as I've been doing comics. I self-published my first comic in 2009, um, and I think it was 2009, then 2010, sometime around then. Um, but I find that self-publishing is um, 
much harder to get people to get into than putting a book, uh, comic online for free. Yeah, of course. Because if people read the comic online for free, they'll usually have the incentive to buy the book already. So. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, do, do you find that once people read it for free, they're, they become more willing to pay for it? Yes. Um, well, yes and no. <laughs> Some people... Um, they do have that mindset of, well, I read this for free, so I want to support it. Hmm. Um, I, I, I like to think of it as like kind of like an NPR kind of thing, where like it's public radio, it's public comics, everyone gets to enjoy it for free, but a select number of people are, being, are able to afford to support it financially. Hmm. Um, however, there's also a subset of the internet um, of webcomic readers that definitely don't have any intent to give any creator support ever. <laughs> a little disheartening. But since I've been doing this for so long, I've seen people change on that view. It's like, I can only hope that like, in five years when people like, have like, disposable income and like, are more financially stable, yeah. they can like, Yeah, well, that's an issue when people don't have any money to right, give you. Right, right. Yeah. Which like, I completely understand. Like, if you don't have any money to consume media, like, there's nothing you can do about that. Mm. Um, but the, I mean, there are people who are like, well, I get this for free, so I don't need to pay any money. Now, have you run into the issue, I mean, I've, I did an episode of year two, or could it be three years, the time goes by so fast, um, ago, where I talked to a, a couple of guys I know who have done uh, erotic comics and ran into some trouble with some of the outlet, self-publishing outlets who won't, won't let them publish some stuff. Oh, yes. I have had many horrible experiences with that. Um, I, I'm lucky enough now to have a, a handful of printers that I work with who do print um, explicit content. They're very, very nice and they're very, very good. Um, but I've also been rejected so many times from printers for like just having a dick in my comic. It's, like, su <laughs> it's super disheartening. And a lot of like the online like webcomic publishing platforms, um, uh, they don't they usually don't allow it. There are like a handful who are okay with it, but you usually have to like censor or something. So it's drawing erotica and selling erotica is a tricky issue. Yeah. <laughs> I wish it wasn't so complicated, but that's how it is. Now it looks like your your comic is that on Tumblr or? Uh, it's on several different places. I'm actually working on a um, uh, building a new site right now to like okay. coalesce everything into one place. Um, but it's on Tumblr as the main site. Like, if you go to ablycomic.com, that's that's what shows up as the Tumblr site. Um, it's also on Smack Cheese, it's on Tapas, it's, it's a couple, couple different places. Hmm, I see. Now, I noticed, now, now when, when did this comic start? When did you first start putting it out? I started doing it in February 2014. Okay. So it's been over three years since I started it. Yeah, because I noticed, I can't remember how far in it was, uh, it was, it was before there was any nudity but um there's there's a bit of a political statement in there with the one character uh encountering the yard sign for oh, uh I forgot about that. yeah there, there's a like it's like supporting a proposition to you know voting on a proposition to uh support traditional marriage only or something right. and that, that feels dated now right? yeah right it's already been two years ago the supreme court decision exactly did away with it anyway. it was very relevant in 2014 yeah so. <laughs> now it's a historical artifact right, right i mean the comic takes place in 2014 um which people forget a lot of the time hmm. it's it's i mean other than that i try not to put too many things in there that date it severely hmm. like that so i see um but the other thing that i noticed about that was I I wasn't I mean I doubt that Japanese boys love ever has political statements in it. No. Very, very, very rarely. It is changing, so I wouldn't be surprised if it happened now. because um, there are a lot more uh, liberal things that are happening in boys love um, than there used to be and what people's general perception of what it is is hasn't it's not really changing, but people who actually read it, like they see the change. Um, but yeah, it's as far as like a traditional boys' love go goes. Like my comic doesn't fit that mold, and I don't want it to fit that mold. Um, like part of my thing is that like 
I love boys love, but I realize that there's a lot of issues within it. Like there's a lot of stuff that's really not good about consent, about like gender roles and about just, there's a lot of really bad stuff in there. And I recognize that and I want to like work on that within the genre. So I think by like presenting my comic, which does focus a lot on consent, on like healthy relationships, um, like it gives people who like are reading that stuff kind of a different view and lets them like demand more, better stuff, which is my hope for the future. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I've, like I said, I've not been a boys love reader. Is it, do, are do those comics sometimes get a little rapey? Or? Mm. Oh, goodness, yes. <laughs> okay. Un- unfortunately, yes. It's, um, yeah, it's kind of uh, the uh, stereotypical yaoi trope is the, or boys love uh, trope is the one character does not want to, and the other character says, yes, we are going to, and mm. it's a very bad time all around. And it makes a lot of people uncomfortable, but it's become such, like, a huge thing in the genre that it's, like, not doing it is, like, seen as bad marketing. Um, so it, it is changing. I mean, I'm not, I don't live in Japan, I don't work in Japan, I don't work in the industry, so I can't speak 100% accurately to it, but I think it, um, it's starting to shift towards healthier stuff. Yeah, I mean, I think that kind of thing has been typical in heterosexual oh, yeah. stuff in Japan, too, yeah. where, um, I mean, even in, like, non-graphic stuff where, you know, the woman is saying no, 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 and then, you know, w- once once the guy starts going for it, she changes her mind suddenly. Yeah, you know? yep. <laughs> she just needs that push, of course. Yeah. Of course. Like, well, on the other hand, sure, why not? Yeah, <laughs> like, I... I, I understand that I think like the, the whole reason why Boys Love became a thing was because uh, people won a fantasy that they could escape into. Like A lot of the erotica uh, that comes out of that genre is meant to be escapism. Um, so people use that as an excuse a lot to be like, oh, it's okay if there's rape, it's okay if there's like severely unhealthy relationship, relationships. Because I just want to read it and I want to have fun, which I get. And I'm like for that for the most part, but... Um, when it starts to become a problem and it starts to affect uh, the views of the people who are reading it, mm-hmm. it I, I, I think it needs to be changed. Uh, people see it as a fantasy. I'm, I'm just, I'm a little curious if, I mean, you know, of course there are guys who like to watch girl-on-girl mm-hmm. action. I mean, is, is it the exact same dynamic, you think, with women reading Boys Love? Or? Um, not necessarily. Uh, I mean, don't get me wrong, there are definitely uh, women who read Boys Love and have very confusing views of what like actual gay relationships are. Like, uh, I try to merge the two between like Boys Love as a fantasy aspect and Boys Love as an accurate depiction for gay relationships. Um, and I try to find a middle ground to some degree. Um, but I mean, there, there are people within the genre who like read Boys Love and are super homophobic in real life, and those people are not okay, <laughs> and I want them to go away. Um, hmm, okay, well, do you, do you think that they're, that somehow they sort of put it in a different basket, that it's somehow not gay? It's, yeah, or? I don't, I don't know what they're thinking, I, I think because it, it, it's usually used as escapism, people view it as, um, like... Or because it's fiction, it's different, or...? I don't, I don't know. I, I, I think it's because it's fiction. I think people sometimes think have this idea of it's forbidden, mm. which is garbage, <laughs> because gay relationships shouldn't be forbidden. Yeah, I, I just... I don't know what they're thinking, honestly. <laughs> I, I, I hope that by, like, by doing Boys Love that is a little bit more realistic um, and does not so much focus on the forbidden aspect um, it, it'll show that people show people that like you can not be a shitlord and read these comics yeah well it was I don't know if it's typical of boys love to have other characters sort of giving their views of of gay relationships. I noticed there was some of that in, in your comic, but... Um, um, it, that, that is in Boys Love sometimes, um, but it's usually like, you can't be with him because he, that's wrong or whatever. Yeah. Um, 
but I don't know. I, but, like, yeah, in, in this one, you've got his mom telling him, no, it's okay. Yeah. You know, if you like this guy, it's okay. Yeah. And he's sort of in denial about it. Yeah. But. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I guess I just wanted to set up the premise that, like, the forbidden aspect is not because they're gay. Mm. Like, if, there, if anyone gets that feeling from the comic, it's not because of the fact that they're gay. For their own emotional garbage that they're working on. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I wanted to go back to the wings. Is there? Is, did you intend any sort of uh, symbolic aspect to the wings? Uh, not really. <laughs> okay. I mean, you could think of it that way that it was so, something to do with coming of age or becoming comfortable with the sexuality sure, or sure. something. I mean, I mean, the reason why he grows wings at this point in his life like there's a reason for that like mm -hmm. I mean he's graduating from high school and he's like trying to figure out what to do with himself and like, try, it's trying to encapsulate that feeling with physical aspects of the wings kind of manifest in that way um, but it's more it's more of a plot device than anything else so how often do you put out this comic uh, right now, I'm doing three pages a week, um, updates Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Saturdays. Hmm, okay. Hmm, that's a pretty tough schedule. Uh, well, I actually do this full time. Um, okay. I uh, have a Patreon, which I'm sure you know about Patreon. Sure. Um, and I uh, have gotten a lot, a lot of support on Patreon. It's been... Uh, it, yeah, it, I remember. I, I did see your Patreon. Yeah, yeah. Just, yeah. You know, pretty decent income. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so I, I do that full time. I was able to quit my job a couple months ago, and that film's been when I started doing the two pages a week because I could not do that and do my full time job. No. <laughs> that way. Do you ever have any issues with like getting motivated to draw? Do you feel kind of like now? Uh, not really. I mean, before I was doing this full time, my motivation was I want to see them in love. <laughs> That's my motivation for telling a lot of stories. Uh, uh, but now it's like, it's my job. So, I mean, I still have that feeling of like, I want to see this through to the end because I enjoy the characters, I enjoy the story. Um, but it's also, like, I don't get paid if I don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now, have you done any other comics before this? Uh, before this, yes. I've done, a, well, my first web comic I did in 2008, and that was called Acid Monday, and it was also Boys Love. It was really bad. Please don't read it. <laughs> I mean, people enjoyed it, but I'm like, that comic is like 10 years old, and I'm like, mm -hmm. I don't want to look at it anymore. Not reflective of your current... Uh, no, no, no. Not at all. Artistic level. Yeah. yeah. So I've been doing, um, like, web comics off and on for the past decade, and I've put out a couple different ones. And, but this is... this ABLA is my longest one so far. Okay. Yeah, it started three years ago. And has it always been three three times a week? Or, no, no. Uh, I started doing that at the beginning of this year. Yeah. So when you when you had a day job, it wasn't possible. No. Well, yeah. No. I was doing two pages a week, I think. Okay. Which was still a lot, but. Yeah. Okay. And then you've been doing conventions, or yeah, yeah. Yeah. I uh, I mostly do anime conventions because um, I do make doujinshi. My style is more anime. Yeah. Um, so people are usually nicer to me there. <laughs> <laughs> So you, you wouldn't want to go to like San Diego or no <laughs> or Emerald City? Or no, no, like no, no, no. <laughs> I mean, I think they were, like I I do have friends in the industry who like tell me to come to these comic cons, but uh, I don't think I would sell well there, and that's my main motivation to going to conventions to make a little bit extra money. Uh, now, are you drawing? Are you drawing electronically? Um, Avi is actually done well. It's mostly done traditionally. I do uh, pencils electronically, and then I print them out and do everything with ink. Mm, I see. But I, I do other comics. I'm starting another comic called Impact Theory, and that's all digital. And, mm, okay. Yeah. And is that voice level also? Yeah. yeah. Mm. Have, have you thought about working in any, any other genre? No. No? <laughs> I, I, I had an indie comic phase, and I was miserable. <laughs> so I, like... After going through that, I was uh, I made the realization that like if I'm gonna make comics, I want to make the comics that I enjoy making I see. and I enjoy reading, which is quite <laughs> fun. Yeah. I see. Okay. Have you 
Well, of course, you were at MCAD, but I mean, have, have you interacted much with like comics community in Minneapolis or um, a little or? bit? Um, I mean, I do know some of the people around here. I know there is a great, a really good comics community in Minneapolis, um, but a lot of the community for what I do is online, so I don't have a whole lot of like connections outside of my home within the city. But, um, I did work in the industry as a like production designer for a while, um, so I have connections through that, but I, I find that um, it's I'm much happier and much uh, better off not working within the industry and just doing my own thing. Sure, well, you know, these days you can do that easily. Right, enough, right. So. I think I've, like, with, like, the advent of Patreon, like, it's completely changed my life and it's been incredible. So. Yeah, I'm trying to do that. <laughs> yeah, it's super hard. Yeah, just kind of getting enough, getting the critical mass of right, right. people. It, I, I find that's a snowball effect. Like, I, I my Patreon was pretty pretty well off for the first like two years, but within the last year, it's like gone exponential growth. So. What do you think was? Could you identify like kind of a turning point? What, what the porn? That? <laughs> that's what it was. <laughs> I know. It's, I mean, part of it is like uh, it gets it gets to a certain point where people are so excited about the story that they want to share it with their friends. Oh, so and when it got to, when it got to the sex part of the story, that that set it off. Yeah, yeah. Okay, it's I usually see. the selling point for a lot of people, which I'm fine with. That's still new. <laughs> I get it. <laughs> as long as it's the part me, I don't care. <laughs> I see. So once once the pants came off, then the money started rolling. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> Pretty much, pretty much. That's the body part we were waiting to see? Yep, yep. yep. Okay. Have you ever been to Japan? Mm -mm. No? Nope. I would like to go, but it's not feasible with my current schedule. Right, yeah, you'd have to take a hiatus from the comic. Yeah, that would be bad. travel anywhere. Yeah. Or maybe when you finish the story, uh, it's a Well, I don't really have... Uh, I mean, I'm trying to work in more breaks into my life because... I don't do that right now and it's not good um, but part of the thing with doing webcomics I find is that um, if you set anything down for an extended period of time people tend to forget about you so since it's like my like my livelihood I make all my money through doing this um, I am like nervous of ever setting it down which like I do have an end point I do have an end to the story um, but I'm working on another comic right now to like take over that at yeah. some point so. I see yeah well, that's that's the difficult part of this. <laughs> You've got your own business going, but you, you can't really give yourself a vacation. No, no. You can't let your coworkers pick up the slack. No, I can't. <laughs> I do have an assistant, and they're very good. Oh, wow. Okay. But um, but there's, like, only so much. Like, I still have to, like, physically draw the pages. Like, mm -hmm. like they can help a lot. But it's... What does your assistant do? Oh, they, they also do comics. I mean, is it doing background oh, or something? Okay. Or? Uh, yeah, they do like black spotting and they do all the freckles. One of my characters has freckles. Yeah. And they're all done by hand. <laughs> so my assistant is a godsend and they do all the freckles. They do a lot of the detail work. Is there some other genre of story you like to read but you can't picture yourself working on? Um, I... Yes. <laughs> I mean, I do I do like the, the good old like fantasy story every now and then. But um, I'm not super interested in telling like a fantasy epic by any means. That's not. It's first of all, it's super hard to do, <laughs> and it's like not, not really uh, a thing that I'm interested in making. Like the other thing is that everyone wants to do a fantasy epic. Mm, yeah. But, yeah, they're yeah. a dime a dozen online. Exactly. <laughs> Right, yeah, it's, it's a pretty crowded genre. Right, right, which, like, it's fine, like, I, I understand why, like, people enjoy that genre, so they want to make stuff for it. Mm -hmm. um, but I find that that genre, especially especially in webcomics, is very prone to uh, people starting it, doing 30 or 50 pages, and then not doing anything ever again. Ah. So, <laughs> like, if I can stay away from that as much as possible, like, that's good for me.
Check the show notes for photos of and links to both of the creators featured in this episode. Tell us what you think. Write us at mail at deconstructingcomics.com, Twitter at Decon Comics, like our Facebook page, or join our Facebook discussion group. All our social media links can be found on the right sidebar at deconstructingcomics.com. Also, please give us a review on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, or iHeartRadio. And we can be found on the Comics Podcast Network at comicspodcast.com. And, newly as of last week's episode, we're now in a partnership with comiccon.com, where our episodes will appear a few days before they show up in the usual feed. Our theme is from bensound.com. If you're looking for some constructive feedback on your comic, send it to us and Mulele and I will critique it on our spinoff podcast, Critiquing Comics. Send it to mail at deconstructingcomics.com. We'll read at least 30 pages of it and critique it on the show. The most recent episode is right behind this one in the podcast feed. This Thursday on To the Bat Poles, some of the people I interviewed for Deconstructing Comics during my trip, including Christopher Jones, weigh in on Batman. They share their memories of watching Batman as kids and consider the question, what if someone else had played Batman? What did Adam West bring to the role? Also, our mom, yes, our mom, shares her memories of watching us grow up with Batman and how her sewing skills helped us out on more than one occasion. Look up To The Bat Poles wherever you find your podcasts or at tothebatpoles.libsyn.com. Speaking of my trip, I've got podcast content coming out of my ears here. Seriously, when I woke up this morning, I found a creator interview lying on my pillow. And some of the content is a bit time sensitive. So this coming Thursday, we'll have a bonus episode of Deconstructing Comics featuring Jenny Robb, curator of the Billy Ireland Cartoon Library and Museum, and an associate professor at Ohio State University. She'll talk about the museum's 40th anniversary exhibit and how the museum chose which comics to include. Also, how is it that comics became such a male-dominated field? How was color information for newspaper comics sent to other papers in the era of Little Nemo? Those questions and more with Jenny Robb. And speaking of classic comics, also in Thursday's bonus episode, a talk with Mike Curtis, who currently has writing duties on Dick Tracy. On his watch, Dick Tracy has won the Harvey Award for Best Syndicated Strip three straight years. Mike's been in comics for some time. He was among the last writers to work on Harvey Comics in the late 80s. We talk about some decisions he's made as Dick Tracy writer, his Shanda the Panda series, and more. That's all coming this Thursday. Till then, this is Tim, and thanks for listening to Deconstructing Comics.